show. I'd like to uh, take time to welcome everybody back to The Watchmen. We've been absent for a little while, but we're just a couple of dudes sitting on the wall watching the world go by. Good to talk to you again, Checkmate. How we doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Paul. How are you doing, man? Well, I'm ready for 2023. Uh, <laughs> enjoying uh, what appears to be some quiet here initially at the start of the year in between what you and I have discussed as being birth pangs. Uh, not a whole lot going on, but we got some things we're going to talk about. Uh, any general impressions you have as we we come into 2023? One really doesn't need any conspiracy theory whatsoever. The world is just a fascinating place as far as I'm concerned. And yeah. yes, and uh, uh, reality is much stranger than fiction. Isn't that the truth? Uh, we're going to start with... Uh, the Catholic Church, uh, Checkmate had given me this article. And the reason we bring this up and the reason we talk about it, there are folks who listen to this uh, production that we do. And I know there are plenty of folks who uh, are Bible-believing Christians who read the book of Revelation, and they make an argument or they think that the, uh, the Catholic Church will play a role in the uh, end time scenario that's discussed in the book of revelation now whether or not that that person whether or not the pope is the the antichrist or the false prophet now that's up for discussion but there are plenty of people who pay close attention to what what happens coming out of rome and so that's why we're talking about this now you know the reality of that remains to be seen um and uh, you'd sent me this article, late Cardinal Pell called for Pope Francis, or called Pope Francis, quote, a catastrophe in leaked memo. Yeah, the circumstances surrounding this are a bit murky, and I myself was raised Catholic, uh, and I, I personally, I understand a lot of the gripes against the institution. I understand a lot of the gripes about Catholicism in general in terms of its uh, methods with respect to Bible exposition. Uh, I get it all, uh, you know, now that I'm non-denominational, but you, the fact of the matter is there are some great, wonderful people, terrific minds who still count themselves as Catholic, uh, and they give the institution a certain level of homage, uh, and they, uh, they, 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 that is their, the focus of their faith. So, I get it for people who are Catholic. I also get it for people who don't particularly care for it. But I think that this memo uh, that uh, if you go to this story that Paul has uh, posted here, it's from The Independent via Yahoo Life. The letter itself uh, is really an, uh, I don't want to say it's an indictment, but it really does point to uh, a basic theme that, hey, this church, the Church of Peter, uh, Apostle Peter has had some problems and they're not getting better. Uh, they're not maturing with age. Uh, and I think that to each and every person who might take a moment and look at Cardinal Pell and think that he is in the company of the guilty, that maybe you might give that a second thought. And you also might look at there are some inside dissidents in the Catholic Church these days. And their voices deserve to get heard because I think you would find that maybe you have a great deal more in common with them than you might suspect. And I just want to leave it with that light touch because it is such a such a touchy issue. And I think I would recommend to everybody who would listen to what it is we're talking, um, Church Militant, as well as... Uh, uh, gosh, um, uh, former Archbishop uh, Vigano, uh, what his commentary on what is happening in the world scene that, you know, these two men as figures who speak on Catholicism but refuse to give up on it, uh, that they are uh, really uh, reigning in as people who are uh, still in the fight with respect to the Catholic Church and its current direction. So, uh, Cardinal Pell, he has been maligned, uh, and I would just say read his letter and make up your own mind for yourself. All right, uh, and and for those of you who will be interested, we're going to provide links to all of these articles when we put this up on uh, 
paulthepoke.com, also at valortube.com, and we'll also be at youtube.com. We'll have links for all of these things. You can pull them up, look at them yourselves, read them, make your own decisions. Uh, and with that, we're going to transition to Ezekiel 38. Got the New King James Version up here. Uh, specifically, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, what's going on in uh, Russia and you, well, specifically what's going on and what is uh, Eastern Ukraine in regards to the Russians. And why do we care about the Russians? Well, because of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we are of the opinion, Gog, the leader of the land of Magog, we believe Magog is <clears throat> modern day Russia. Now, that's a very controversial statement, but it's what we believe. And we also believe that uh, eventually, Turkey will join Russia, and they will also be joined uh, in verse 5 by Persia, ancient Persia, or modern-day Iran, and then a couple of uh, African company, countries, Ethiopia, Sudan, the area that is ancient Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Libya, along with um, many people are with you. And we've talked about that extensively. Just the proxies <clears throat> involved uh, in this part of the world with Russia and then all the Iranian proxies along the uh, Arabian Peninsula and in the Middle East up in Lebanon. So with that, we're going to take a kind of an overview uh, of what's actually taking place. We got this from War Mapper uh, at Twitter. Again, a link will be provided for this as well. And this is the latest operational update as of today. And give you a little bit of a, of a picture as to what's taking place. And uh, this is kind of right, in your, uh, right up your alley, checkmate. Yeah, um, I think that one of the things, I, I've certainly posted this uh, to Valotube, this particular map, uh, is that... Um, I honestly think the Russians are kind of satisfied with the gains that they've had. And if you look at nearly every overture that manages to break through the ether in terms of a ceasefire or some kind of peace, it's coming from the Russians. And I think that they've got these lands and I think they're kind of OK with it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that. The Russians, unlike uh, the United States, unlike the Ukrainians, they're fighting their war, so to speak, on budget, which is that uh, they have a national production for however much ammunition that they would need to expend to uh, defend the homeland. They're doing it, uh, and they're largely doing it through indirect fire, being artillery. Uh, so the Ukrainians, they make breakthroughs here and there, but they're usually beaten back by artillery barrages. And so the lines have pretty well stabilized based on what you see here. My belief is that we're in a situation now where it is incumbent upon uh, the White House and the Congress, now that it's changed hands, to be able to say, look, this is not going to go much further Uh you know, regardless of what equipment we give you, you're not going to make a breakthrough. You're not going to repatriate these lands. Uh, let's do business and let's go with the current lines. Uh, we'll have to wait and see because I legitimately believe that that's where Vladimir Putin is, is that he's got what he came for. And I think that a lot of the I'm going to take Kiev, I'm going to envelop Ukraine. I, I believe that that was a disinformation campaign deliberately launched that this was really what he was looking for all along, was for Russia to have an umbilical uh, to the port in Sevastopol uh, to be able to reinforce its holdings in much warmer waters than uh, what they have in, on the northern coast and the western, or the eastern, I should say, Pacific coast. And that, that's what, this is coming up on a year now. We are about, what, we're a good 11 months, almost 11 months into this conflict. And yeah, just shy. Yeah, because that started, what was it, uh, February of 22, so well, February 24th, 1922 is when they started. And you, you know, you talk about the economics of it and, you know, we, you got, we got this from memory.org. Uh, for the time being, Russia looks secure against financial troubles. And I mean, if you look at what has happened with the Russian economic situation since 
you know, this began roughly a year ago. The ruble is stronger. And effectively, they are transferring who they are selling their resources, their energy uh, commodities to. Instead of going to the West in Europe, that is shifting and going East to India and China. And this is a very deep dive, extensive look into the current status of Russian economics. I know you had several thoughts on this. I did. Uh, what what you're looking at in this article is that the the guy who wrote it uh, does does something. It's a recurring theme, and it becomes a bit tiresome. But it's it's worth noting that our own Office of Management and Budget does it. Is that he he says, listen, the Russian budget protections projections for the upcoming year are garbage. Uh, you know, just don't pay attention to them. They're smoke and mirrors. Well. Got some news for you. Ours are too in the United States. Um, the European Union, theirs are garbage too. Uh, it's it's all a bunch of political theater. But his higher point is in the closing paragraphs, and and one of the points that he makes is uh, Russia had kind of pre-planned to opt out of the International Economic Club because he viewed. Uh, because they viewed the economics of the international scene, if you will, uh, the larger players, the great powers, if you will, the European Union, China, the United States, as being economically suicidal. And I tend to agree with that. Uh, and uh, I think that in his closing, he actually makes that point, um, if not forthrightly, uh, what he basically says is there really is no substitute for managing your uh, your debts and your spending in a way that you always know that there's going to be some sort of reconciliation. So it's it, it's a little difficult to read because you're getting a face full of the guy's opinion on debunking the Russian budget projections. But his conclusion where he brings it together, here's why the Russians have their act together. It is worth reading, if nothing else. The last two paragraphs that you, Paul, have uh focused on the page right now well that's the thing too and you mentioned all these different uh governments around the world but you look specifically at the part of the world that we're interested in from a prophetic standpoint you look at the russians uh the chinese and, and i dare say you you interject the indians into this discussion those central banks are buying up gold like nobody's business right now and I mean, they are gobbling that stuff up and they are trying to get hold of physical gold in their, you know, to support, you know, as a backing for for their economic uh, situation. And which makes me, you know, we've had this discussion as well as far as uh, those those the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa looking to have their own basket of currencies. Well, it's got to be backed in something. And they're wanting to do this with commodities. And so you see them kind of collectively selling these things to each other and then have it all being backed uh, in physical commodities, oil, gold, natural gas, et cetera. So I think it's a fascinating development. Um, you know, and they're all dumping dollars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we do need to pay attention to this. You know, for no other reason, you know, again, taking a look at uh, this has been an ongoing theme of mine for going on over a decade now. At some point, you know, as we get closer to this seven year uh, or the time of Jacob's trouble, the last week, according to Daniel, seven year period, hyperinflation is going to be present on a global scale. <clears throat> and so what these what these folks are doing economically, how they're all aligning, what they're doing, they're dumping dollars, they're trying to gain commodities, you, you dump a whole bunch of dollars, they, they become more worthless. It's going to lead to high, it's going to lead to inflation. And at some point right. that, that, that shoe's going to drop. Now, when and where, I don't know and what that looks like, but it's plausible to, to come to that conclusion. So, um, do you have anything else on that? Uh, no, not really. I would just, I would just say this. I mean, I, you know, I've come in for flack of being uh, pro-Russian. When I went to college, I studied the Eastern Front uh, quite a bit, uh, uh, and uh, in World War Two, World War One uh, as well. And one of the things that I, I realized about the Ru the Russians is that um, 
they don't really care whether you like them or not. What they really care about is do you respect them and what they're capable of on a national level. Um, I am. Uh, I'm not, you know, there are certain things about Russian culture that I appreciate, but generally speaking, that government, I mean, they can go hang as far as I'm concerned. But the uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, they're really getting something right here, is that they're noticing that the Western system that they have been repeatedly invited to join since the wall fell, uh, that uh, Boris Yeltsin actually did make overtures to join it. Uh, but what did he get for it? He, he, he got he got looted. For all intents and purposes, uh, so their attitude is uh, very real politic. Uh, we could stand to take a few lessons from them. And uh, I think that the direction that things are going with respect to Russia, uh, especially uh, the prophetic issue, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see what it, what's in the long term future for the Russian people. But I do believe that Vladimir Putin right now is making some incredibly astute moves for somebody who is considered isolated. Uh, I guarantee you, if you ask the Indians or the Chinese, Vladimir Putin is not isolated. He's running the boards on us. I uh, hundred percent. He's playing. He's playing chess, and we're playing checkers. <laughs> we're playing. We're playing Stratego at best. So. <laughs> well, and that, and that speaks to your your comments. Speak to how we view the world. We are we're Western civilization. We're you know we're we got a big ocean between us and and that part of the world. We see things through our eyes, and we don't understand. We don't understand. And, you know, I'm talking about the populace in general. Doesn't understand Russia culturally, and then that, that transition to you know the other player in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy. You got Russia along with Iran. We're going to talk about Turkey today. They'll do something. We'll get to talk about them some more in the future. But this is for this from the Center for Security Policy because we don't get Iran. We don't understand what's happening, and I think. You know, we got another setup where we just talked about our lack of understanding with Russia. And here we have the same thing going on with Iran. And this is a piece you found out about it. And I know you had some thoughts on this as well. Well, this is where Checkmate's got to fess up a little bit. And that is that the author of this is a friend of mine, David Wormser. Um, David uh, was blamed for a long time for being the guy who started the Iraq war. And um uh, if if you met the guy, you would understand how impossible that is. Uh, you know, George Bush was hell bent on going into Iraq the moment he took office in 2000. Uh, or I'm sorry, it was 2001 because we had the recount in the Supreme Court case. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, um, the article that he writes here is really it's it's worth your time in the sense that not because what Dave Wormser says dictates what happens in the Middle East, but, you know, it's interesting what Dave Wormser and I talk about tends to materialize at some point. Uh, it, it's just because he and I have really these elevated discussions that are, you know, um, intellectual excellence, and I am the pretender in those discussions, I assure you. Long and short of it is, is that this revolt that is going on in Iran right now is far different than anything we've ever seen. I believe that the population has decided that's it. We are done with this particular regime. We're done. So uh, because uh, the, the Islamic Republic defines itself as a revolutionary government, the problem that they have is that uh, the revolution is going in perpetuity, uh, which means that the revolutionary methods, which are to most people's standards, we would consider unforgivable, quite brutal, in fact. Uh, they, the revolutionary methods continue in perpetuity because it's a revolutionary government, that they have met their counter-revolution now. And it is more humane uh, if crude and a little bit clumsy uh it is reading what the regime is doing and it is reacting to it and it's doing it in what intelligence analysts would call near real time so 
because the United States really doesn't get the Iranian population, really doesn't understand uh, where it is their hearts are, what it is they're driving at, they're not really looking to join the West as such. What they're looking for is they're looking for a society that is much more an expression of the popular will in their own country. And bluntly, that looks nothing like Western Europe. Uh, th what they're what they're looking for is uh, an indirect democracy, I would say, is that they have leaders who are reflecting the desires of the population, maybe not getting it right 100 percent of the time, but are, are, are at least trying. So with this article, I, I, I recommend it because we don't we, we've never in the United States since the Iran Revolution really gotten what it is these people uh, seek, what their national aspiration is, because uh, everybody has looked for in the foreign policy circuit, they've always looked for the grand breakthrough with Iran. There is no grand breakthrough. You're, you're, you're just not going to get it. Uh, and uh, and so that's what he writes about here. Uh, and it was um, it's uh, it's an interesting piece of writing. He advised uh, Trump. He advised uh, Cheney uh, and. Uh, he might have had a little bit of my advice along the way in terms of what I thought, you know, Iran policy ought to be. Uh, but uh, it is worth a read because it is a very good pulse on what 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 it is that the Iranian people want vice our national policy, which forever has been what is the Iranian national will as expressed through its government. Incidentally, this relates to the previous topic that Iran has had a second set of life given to it uh, by the very fact that when the Russians wanted to learn how to beat the finer points of sanctions, they went to the Iranians. You are now seeing Iranian bodyguards in Moscow, and you're seeing Russian bodyguards in Tehran. That is how intimate this whole thing has gotten. And they're, they're essentially setting up their own economic system just to bypass the West. Is you know just yeah. just me watching this happen. Um, this is quite a lengthy read. It's good stuff uh, for those of you it who is, are interested. And and and, and I, I I grudgingly put that up because. Um, as much as I as as much as you know, Dave is my friend, and 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 I admire his intellect. I'm no fan of the Center for Security Policy just because of the name that you know, Frank Gaffney. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Frank Gaffney, but uh, but uh, this is worth your time. And um, I would like to thank our audience. We'll take the time to do that. <laughs> it's not a, and we go from that, folks. If you read nothing else read this it's good stuff um we go from that into we got this going on in the middle east and we have this is from axios um provide a link to this as well exclusive bipartisan senate delegation visiting abraham accords countries and so um we got democrats we got republicans um, and they're going over to the Middle East, and they're going to visit Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco. And I find this very curious. I suspect, I can't prove this, that our senators, both Democrats and Republicans, are going to go over there. And I won't be surprised if Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia is there somewhere. <coughs> and we're not laying some groundwork uh, with Israel for, you know, the Saudis to join the Abraham Accords. Netanyahu's made that pretty clear. If you guys follow Israeli politics, that's something that's important to him is he would like to see a formalized peace established with the Saudis. And uh, the Saudis have, you know, made some, uh, I guess you would say, steps to allow Israeli planes to fly over their airplace or airspace and land at their airports. And so there's some things taking place, you know, from an economic standpoint, where these two sides are showing to be cozy with each other. And I find it fascinating that, you know, 
and especially with all the stuff that's going on with currently with President Biden and all these documents that classified documents keep showing up in his garage next to his Corvette or at his office or at his house or wherever, then at some point we may have a little drive for peace to distract some people or something of that nature. I don't know. But do you, do you have any thoughts on this as you see this little article, piece of news? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the Abraham Accords have some momentum behind them, it's certainly not because of something that we're doing, but because uh, the fact that the Israelis want it, uh, the Saudis seem to want it, uh, that, um, you know, for the time being, that everybody's looking at the Leviathan of the Iran nuclear program and concerned about what it may portend. And the Saudis have already secured their agreement that they have a warhead sharing agreement with Pakistanis, but I don't think that the Saudi government is ready to take that one to the bank. Uh, so I think they would rather have uh, something that they could consider an air defense agreement with the uh, with the Israelis before they would uh, rely on the Pakistani military. Interesting times. I, I think we're going to be hearing more about this in the upcoming year. Just my just my gut. And, and you know, prophetically, uh, again, we go back to Ezekiel 38, ancient Sheba, ancient Dedan, modern day Saudi Arabia. They're going to stand by when Russia and their allies want to come into Israel from the north at some point in the future. And this would be yet another piece, another domino being set up that would allow that to happen. Um, you know, the, the Southern end of this, if you will, ancient, ancient Sheba, ancient Dedan just kind of stands around and protests. They don't intervene. They're just saying, are you really going to come in there and take a bunch of stuff? Are you really going to steal plunder, you know, over economic issues? Um, uh, and that would mean that Israel has to be aligned politically with Saudi Arabia when this goes down. So, um, I think it's worth talking about. Uh, now, the last thing we're going to talk about uh, is just this concept of lawlessness. And it's just, it's global in scale. So just give you guys like a, an idea of when I start looking at stuff in the original Greek or Hebrew, I like to do lots of word studies. And so the Greek word for lawlessness is anomia. And uh, A, not, Namas, nomo, nomos, law, no law, properly, without law, lawlessness. And holy cow, we are in a world of increasing lawlessness. And our press is not touching this story at all. Don't want anything to do with it. And the happenings in and around the most recent Brazilian election. Uh, and then who was a Bolsonaro, left the country, went to the United States, ended up in a hospital. And then we've got uh, Brazilian cops speed through protesters in police car as rioters who stormed the nation's Congress. I like this in January 6th style attack, a little bias there, marched out in handcuffs. And, um, you know, there, there are lots of people in Brazil who are upset with the election results. And the thing I have concerns about watching this is this is just going to give fuel to other governments and specifically the left-wing government in Brazil to lock down on personal freedoms. And, you know, we're going to have, people are going to lose freedoms and we're going to have more government uh, imposition of will on the populace as, as and, and, and they'll be justified as they see it. So, pass this on to you with your thoughts yeah. on it we've got you know the monroe doctrine was never renounced and uh, one of the things that has happened is that the chinese have uh you know swooped in and they've bought themselves brazil uh and uh you know you've got to get ahead of the uh the popular will on questions like this and this is one of the things where the church has been conspicuously absent, I would argue, is we need a praying church that's actually doing warfare by prayer uh, to be able to uh, retake these places. Because Brazilian is predominantly Catholic place. But 
the growing church there, and like with our Iran story, uh, the issue with uh, with Iran is that um, I would argue that there's a praying church that is engaged, but they're not taking on the enemy, so to speak. They're kind of passively praying for blessings as opposed to uh, ordering the steps of the heavenly hosts. And that's what we got to do. That's the whole upshot of the book of Acts, I would argue, is that we're co-laborers with the forces of heaven. With respect to Brazil, uh, yes, their president uh, got out of there. He resigned about about a day, I think, before he was supposed to begin. It was a day or two days uh, before he was supposed to announce that he was uh, that he was leaving uh, and uh, handed it off to his vice president, who handed it over to uh, Lula, who's a criminal. He's a thug. And uh, this might get get us kicked off of YouTube, by the way. <laughs> but um, the long and the short of it is, is that Lula is not a good guy. Uh, and uh, he uh, landed in uh, Orlando. I think he probably has a pretty tenuous relationship with this particular White House. Uh, in the middle of this whole thing, uh, Jake Sullivan ran down there to attempt to broker peace. And uh, we ended up with a uh, uh, basically a replay in Brasilia of um, January 6th. And of course, people, yes. when the people of Brazil, they don't believe the result. And I think this this short little article from the Gateway Pundit pretty much says it all. We want the source code. Yeah. Um, there's really the, the, that that picture is the article. Is that is that fair? I think I think that's absolutely reasonable uh, that, you know, the Chinese got themselves Joe Biden and um, and Joe Biden is in so much political trouble right now as we speak that um, my feeling is, is that uh, somebody's going back on the deal. And uh, we in the United States and we in the Western world generally have to be ready for if um, if uh People are going back on the deal. People will seek recompense. Could get messy. Yeah, I got two more years, allegedly, <laughs> before see, the next for the next election. <laughs> we'll 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 see. I mean, this is one of those things where I default to my Navy training, where I want to say steady as she goes, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how steady that can be. Well, that's that's all we've got for uh, for uh, you know the Watchmen this week. Uh, I'm sure there will be other things happen. We will will update accordingly. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, keep your eye on the Israeli government. There's been some things that have happened on the Temple Mount in the past week. Uh, they're not huge, but they are a really good uh, indicator that uh, for once, finally, the Israeli government is serious about asserting its right over the Temple Mount. Uh, and uh, we'll see how that one plays itself out. Are you uh, referring to Mr. Itamar ben or oh, ben Gavir? Yes, of course I am. <laughs> you know it. Yeah, I had a little bit. I talked a little bit about him last week, and just just the drama that created when he just walked up there and walked around for about twelve or thirteen minutes. He didn't do anything but just walk around. And yeah, and of course in the Palestinian press, he stormed it. Well, oh, yeah, he's like up there taking a victory lap, <laughs> and oh man, they they freaked out. And I know some of the, oh, some of the, um, I guess it'd be more fundamental folks in Judaism. Um, they're pretty excited to see him there, and uh, now, th th which is fascinating because that group, uh, you know, the Temple Institute. Uh, modern day Sanhedrin. I mean, there is a line of thinking within that group is that the rebuilding of the temple is, is universal and it is, is it's, it's intention is to bring universal peace. Um, they're not looking to get rid of the dome, the golden dome or the Al Aqsa mosque. They want to put the temple up there with those other structures, kind of have a big kumbaya moment is the idea and put it 
I guess, as I understand it, they'd want to put, you know, the third temple on the north end of that. So. Well, you know, you know, I would ask you, I, I would ask you this, Paul, is, is, is there anybody who has charted out the lineage of the Sanhedrin from the time of Jesus to the current day? I don't think so. And I think that the issue with that is, is a lot of those records got burned in 70 AD. They used to keep all that stuff in the temple, um, you know, up, up until the time of Herod's temple. And then when the when Rome came through and, and torched the place, all those records went with it. And I know I've talked with some people and they are of the opinion that there is a genetic marker for the Levites that shows up in some DNA data that they that they can uh, they feel pretty comfortable identifying I've had, Levites. actually i've had that one actually played back at me by israeli intelligence guys really yeah that they say listen it's genetic that you're a levite and i'm like wait what um so uh, you know i'll you know listen if they believe it then yeah i guess um but uh, the the question that I would have is, um, you know, can we figure out who who is currently uh, the inheritors? Because there is some deuteronomical, if you will, uh, authority for, uh, uh, you know, things being passed down through generations and being able to pronounce. Absolutely. Especially when it comes to to the to the the priest, the priests. Yeah. Uh, now, they. Again, they feel pretty confident because they've got they have a new they have a high priest. They've nominated a high priest. He apparently has that genetic marker. And I even saw I saw something the other day. It's like uh, they think they have genetic markers for and I forget which tribe it was, but Netanyahu, most of the most of the modern day prime ministers are of the same tribe. And I can't remember which one it was. Uh, It was part of the northern kingdom. Uh, that's 10 of them. So I can't, I can't recall that off the top of my head, but, um, you know, ultimately that's, that's what fascinates me. Ultimately, some guy's going to come along and claim to be from the tribe of Judah. And I'm wondering how he's going to have the chops to prove that to the point that they accept that he is from the, you know, the line of David, uh, to fool everybody. And I'm, I've always thought, well, he'll be willing to lie about it. So that's no problem. But um, we'll see. We'll see. But, yeah, goings on in and around the temple, always interesting. We'll we'll talk about those when, when it happens, because it will. It will happen. So That's right. Um, that's all we got for today. You have anything else? No, sir. All right. Well, appreciate you guys taking the time, following along uh, with the Watchmen. Again, just a couple of dudes uh, sitting on the wall watching the world go by. We'll be in touch. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Bye.